First half of January 1942. On the first day of the year 1942, China, Great Britain, USA, and the USSR formed the United Nations Alliance to fight the Axis powers. The next day, another 22 nations joined the alliance. In their declaration, they all pledged to uphold the principles of the Atlantic Charter from the previous summer. Among other things, they express their hope to see established a peace which will afford to all nations the means of dwelling in safety within their own boundaries and which will afford assurances that all the people in all lands may live out their lives in freedom from fear and want. High hopes with little prospect of fulfillment in January 1942. This is War Against Humanity, a sub-series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. In the last half of December, we saw how tens of thousands of Jews in the Transnistrian Bogdanovka camp were burned to death, executed by gunfire or killed with hand grenades. The Holocaust by bullets came to a slow halt as weather and temperature conditions became increasingly unsuitable for mass murder and mass burial. And on the borders of the South China Sea, the Japanese Imperial Army began a military campaign where once again terror and murder is to be part and parcel of their tactics. Throughout the month, the Japanese bombing raids on Singapore that began on December 8th will pick up pace, eventually reaching two to three raids by 27 to 54 aircraft at a time. Ostensibly, the sorties from bases in Vietnam target military installations, airfields, and Singapore's harbor. But like in Europe, the Japanese purposefully or not indiscriminately bomb civilians. Like so much about the conflict in Southeast Asia, the exact numbers of casualties are unclear. The lowest figure is 600 killed and 1,500 wounded civilians, while many other estimates run significantly higher, such as 1,000 civilian fatalities on 21st of January alone. The wrath of the Japanese is also inflicted on prisoners of war as the Imperial Army advances through Malaya. On January 22nd, the Battle of Moir ends in defeat of the United Nations and a forced retreat. The Australian 8th Division and the 45th Indian Infantry Brigade are overrun by Japanese forces. Those who are able flee into the jungle, but up to 300 wounded, at least 110 Australian and 40 Indian wounded, are left at the Pait Sulong Bridge at the mercy of their foes. Little mercy they show. Lieutenant Ben Hackney is among the wounded and later recounts the following events. Many Japanese seemed to delight in kicking where a wound lay open, and so great was their satisfaction at any visible sign of pain that often the dose was repeated. They are shoved together around a small shed, subject to ridicule and abuse by the passing columns of Japanese forces. Photos are staged with Japanese appearing to hand the soldiers water and cigarettes, only to throw them away when the cameras are gone. Eventually, the soldiers are bound together in groups and led onto the bridge. Hackney feigns his death and is left behind. Some of the groups are mowed down with machine guns. In other cases, the Japanese shoot one of the bound men and then shove the group off the bridge into the river, leaving the wounded men to a futile struggle to stay afloat that inevitably ends by them all being dragged down by the current and their dead comrade. The bodies left on the bridge, even some that are still alive, are doused in gasoline and set ablaze. Finally, the bodies are obliterated by repeatedly driving back and forth with trucks over the charred remains. After the Japanese move on, Hackney and the only other survivor escape, but both of Hackney's legs are broken and he will now crawl through the jungle, surviving by scavenging for six weeks until he is recaptured. Scavenging for food is also what faces many Greek people trying to survive the war. Since the German occupation of Greece began in the spring of 1941, all Greek factories have been confiscated, houses have been requisitioned to accommodate occupying soldiers and officers, and foodstuffs are confiscated en masse to feed German, Italian, and Bulgarian personnel. 
At the same time, the Greek collaborationist government under General Georgios Tsoulakoglou is printing money to finance all occupation costs and reimburses the occupiers for any damage suffered on Greek territory, causing high inflation. In difference to Western Europe, where German occupation has been brutal but at least allowed the population to subsist, Greece is pillaged by the Axis powers until there is near to nothing left. In August, the wife of the head of Athens College, Mrs. Homer W. Davis, describes in a letter. The Germans are living at the expense of the country. They did not bring with them food for the men, neither compartments for common meals. The men simply were eating at the restaurants. The units were not sleeping in the barracks to avoid bombardments, but in private houses. Many of those houses were completely spoliated. There are reports that German soldiers were stopping passers-by in Omonoia Square and demanded their watches and other goldware they had with them. A Greek Coast Guard officer returned a few weeks after the occupation began and found nothing in his old office. Anything that could be of use to the Germans, desks, chairs, safes, were taken by them. The rest were either destroyed or used as firewood. The situation is made worse by that the country is blockaded by the Commonwealth allies. Greece has always been dependent on foreign food imports, which now comes to a complete standstill. Two-thirds of the population soon has access to only less than 1,000 calories per day, a bit more than half of the daily energy need for an average adult. A sizable portion of the population is now below the starvation limit. It doesn't take long before the image of malnourished children scavenging the streets become commonplace in Athens and the rest of Greece. When 300 to 400 people succumb to hunger every day in December 1941, the streets fill up with unburied corpses. At long last, efforts are made by the Axis and Allies, sometimes even in cooperation, to bring relief through food shipments and Swedish Red Cross aid. For many, it is too little and too late. The famine reaches its low point in January and February 1942. At least 40,000 Greeks perish in that time frame alone. To the north in Croatia, death is coming at the end of a German execution squad or at the hands of the Ustasha. We've seen Josip Tito's partisan movement shift its focus on Croatia after his Serbian Republic of Usice collapses in a German anti-partisan offensive a few months ago. In Croatia, the partisan fight is mainly directed against the Croatian fascists of the Ustasha who run the independent state of Croatia as an Axis puppet state. On the 12th of January, the partisans kill a handful of Ustasha members in the town of Papuk. In retaliation, the Croats killed 350 Serb men from all over the area after they had been herded together in a town called Vočin. But instead of deterring opposition, the massacre strengthens the public support for the partisan movement. This is not good news for the Germans either, who are growing increasingly impatient with partisan activity in the Balkans. On January 15th, they launch Operation Southeast Croatia to drive out any insurgents. While this is arguably a military operation against a militia, not a resistance movement, the operation is accompanied by indiscriminate killing of combatants and non-combatants alike. On January 9th, the 718th Infantry Division, acting in the Balkans as an internal security unit, is ordered to approach as hostile anyone fitting a broad set of characteristics. Historian Ben Shepard sums them up in Terror in the Balkans. All non-residents and residents who had been absent from their localities until recently, all identifiable Mihailovich people, with or without weapons or ammunition, all identifiable Danjic Chetniks, a group with whom the Germans were not yet supposed to be officially dealing with or without weapons or ammunition, all communists who could be identified in any way with or without weapons or ammunition, and finally, anyone concealing, supplying, or informing the above groups. Anyone who is perceived to fall into any of these groups is interrogated and most often shot. Houses from which shots have been fired are, unless suitable for accommodation, burnt down. The Northeast, the Nazi terror, is making even deeper cuts. 
As the Holocaust by bullets is tapering off, the scale of murder is not as high as in the previous months, but the total number of victims is still staggering. Many individuals, families, or entire small communities are executed for participating in or being suspected of partisan activity, others simply for being Jewish. At the end of the month, the operational report of Einsatzgruppe A states, the number of summary court shootings carried out by Einsatzkommando 5 during the period January 12th to January 24th, 1942, totaled 104 political officials, 75 saboteurs and looters, and about 8,000 Jews. In the past weeks, Einsatzkommando 6 shot 173 political officials, 56 saboteurs and looters, and 149 Jews. There is something new in the way that the German Nazis perpetrate their crimes. Back in December, between 10 and 15,000 Jewish citizens of Kharkiv were forced out of the city to a nearby factory site. Some were shot straight away, but most were interned on the site under pitiful circumstances as they wait for the death squads to finish preparing their demise. Now, the Order Police Battalion 314 and Sonderkommando 4A under the command of Paul Blobel, the same officer who oversaw the mass murder at Babi Yar, go into action. While most victims are shot, Blobel and his men now also use mobile gas vans, in which victims are gassed using the exhaust fumes of the murder trucks. It is the method of mass murder perfected last month at Chelmno by the Gauleiter Vaterland Arto Greisa and SS Sturmbannführer Herbert Lange. In Chelmno itself, they have by now started to run out of victims, but in mid-January they are about to tap into a steady supply of human beings to feed into their killing machines. On January 16th, the SS starts regular transports of men, women, and children from the Wajd ghetto and surrounding smaller ghettos to Shemlo. On arrival, they are reloaded onto coal carts on a regional industrial narrow gauge railroad. Their final destination lays some three kilometers further down the rails. It is here that they will be suffocated in Lange's vans. This is the final step in the meandering search by the Nazis for an answer to their Jewish question. The goal has always been the same. What they have searched for is a method. When the answer was sterilization, it was death at the end of a generation. When it was deportation to Madagascar, it was to achieve death by tropical disease and deprivation. When it was incarceration in ghettos, it was a long, languishing death by starvation while serving the German economy. Then came the more direct answers. Mallets, bullets, and hand grenades. Methods that have already created over a million dead in only months. But Adolf Hitler and his henchmen want more death, and they want it faster. The answer is a weapon so terrible that the Germans themselves do not use it on the battlefield for reason of having it turned on themselves. Transportation by rail into a cloud of lethal gas. Now all that remains is to schedule the trains. Never forget.